We did a smart thing with fifth edition by listening to the fans. And what came out of that process was a system that is stable, that is well loved, that incorporates the best elements of earlier editions. Now that we have that, we are no longer in the position where we think of D&D as an edition. It's just D&D. That's the big news, folks. You heard it here. We are beyond editions of D&D and now entering one D&D, the singularity of D&D, the one edition, so to speak, to rule them all. Jokes aside, one D&D is the code name for the future of D&D. So just like as they were developing D&D 5e, they called this long playtest period D&D Next, one D&D is that. It may or may not also be the name that they're gonna stick with, or just call it D&D, because that's the whole idea. But here's what it actually entails. They're updating the D&D rules, so as we know, we're gonna get new versions of the core books, Player's Handbook, Monster Manual, and Dungeon Master's Guide, expected, as they say, in 2024. And the biggest part of this, in my opinion, is the digital D&D play experience. Let's play a clip of that too. So the D&D digital play experience is supposed to look like a miniature set that will be totally customizable and the maps are supposed to be totally customizable as well saying that you'll get a map in the digital bundle version with the new books that come out but then you'll actually be able to customize that map and build your own with this whole online tool set which honestly all sounds really innovative and is exciting but now my goal for this video is together we will go through the frequently asked questions for one D, &D and then take a quick look at the first glimpse that we have of these new core rules coming in that new player's handbook in 2024 and then in a couple weeks they're going to release a survey so we can give them feedback and they'll theoretically incorporate that feedback into what will become the core rules now is one D, &D introducing a new edition no according to them it's, it's bigger, bigger than, than that. that saying your adventures and supplements from 5e will all work in one DD. What is changing with the one DD rules? As it says here, there will be many fundamental updates. Again, they're changing the core rules a little bit. So even though they're not calling it a different edition, it basically still seems like it's going to be that. And that's why we're going to take a look at this first playtest document in just a second. But it says that these new core rule books are expected to be released in 2024. Prior to this, we've always heard it's coming in 2024. So now that tells me it might get pushed back a little bit. Honestly, I'd rather have more time spent on developing it so that we really get it right if this is gonna be the everlasting version of D&D, which sidebar, I totally don't think that's gonna happen because obviously in 10 or 15 more years, new people will totally be running the company and they're definitely gonna make a new game because that's just how everything works. And now I wanna keep this video short, so we're not doing a deep dive on every little nitty gritty detail of this playtest document, but what I wanna highlight are the major changes to the core rules that we're seeing with character origins. So this is all about race, background, and apparently language they're featuring as like a main thing here. Um, it's kind of not, so let's get into it. And so here's the list, my friends, of the races going to be included in the next player's handbook. Human, a brand new one that we've never heard of or seen before, called the Ardling, the Dragonborn, the Dwarf, Gnome, Halfling, Orc, and Tiefling. So they've kind of done away with half-elf and half-orc and all that stuff, saying that if you do want to create a character that comes from two of these races, you just choose the mechanics of one but can decide however you look. Honestly, it's, it's mostly just flavorful, but it's easy. I like it. Now, humans are very similar. They're still described as like the most versatile, diverse race of all, and that checks out. You can now be medium or small, which is kind of funny. It's starting at two feet tall. Seems very small for a human, but hey, there are all kinds of people out there. And they really just have these three mechanical traits. Resourceful, you gain inspiration whenever you finish a long rest. Inspiration, by the way, is now just getting advantage on a roll. Skillful, you gain an extra skill proficiency. And versatile, you gain the skilled feat or another first level feat of your choice. So things to note there, a first level feat, what is that? Feet trees, are they back? Not exactly, they say they're pretty much just tagging them by level, but the point is here, all backgrounds do give you a feat, but the human and all humans, because there's just one kind of human, now all get an extra feat just like they did in 5e. Now to keep it brief, the Ardling is the planar opposite of a tiefling. 
It has three different legacies, basically sub-races, the Exalted, which come from Chaotic Good Planes, the Heavenly from Lawful Good Planes, and the Idyllic from Neutral Good Planes. We see that with the Tiefling as well. They come from Chaotic Evil, Lawful Evil, and Neutral Evil Planes. Three legacies each. The Ardling can be medium or small. They all have animal faces based on your legacy. You choose a different animal, and then they get spells at first, third, and fifth level. But their other unique feature is Angelic Flight. As a bonus action, you sprout spectral wings for a moment and fly up to a number of feet equal to your speed. If you're in the air at the end, you fall. Ah, and resistance to radiant damage. Pretty cool. Dragonborn, at a glance, looked very much the same to me. Dwarf is interesting to me because there are no more dwarf subraces. They said in a video, like Jeremy Crawford said in a video, that they just tried to make the dwarfiest dwarf. So when you choose the race dwarf, you don't have to worry about different kinds of sub-races of dwarf. You're just the dwarf. And stone cunning is now super cool. If you touch stone as a bonus action, uh, you can get tremor sense with a range of 60 feet. So it's literally like you're sensing the vibrations through that stone. That's a really cool feature. Very mythological for dwarves. I love it. Elves look pretty much the same. Dark vision, now a lineage thing instead of sub-races. So we got Drow, High Elf, Wood Elf, Gnomes, we still have, again, pretty much same look. Gnome Lineage is now Forest Gnome or Rock Gnome. So again, looks like we've done away with the term sub-race. And Halflings, we just have one kind of Halfling. Taking a quick look at Orcs, they can dash as a bonus action and gain a number of temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus when you do so. They have powerful build. Oh, that's exciting. I mean, that was from the original Orc race, so I'm glad they kept that. And Relentless Endurance, when you're reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you drop to one hit point instead. Tiefling, now instead of all being infernal, again, mirroring this new Ardling race, they are either Abyssal, Infernal, or Chthonic from the neutral evil planes. And just like the Ardling, you have these other cantrips and other spells at third and fifth level. But now backgrounds have actually changed quite a bit. The number one thing that I noticed is we don't see those personality traits, bonds, ideals, flaws, any of that anywhere. First, they really emphasize that you should build it yourself. That is now the default, and then the option is choose a sample background. But when you build a background, you get your ability score increases. So no more racial ability score increase. Now it comes from your background. Honestly, this makes sense to me. <laughs> then you get two skill proficiencies, a tool proficiency, and choose one language, one first level feat. So everybody does get a feat. And equipment equaling 50 gold pieces to spend on stuff. Cool. They have a lot of familiar ones here like Acolyte, Artisan, Charlatan, Cultist is a new one. Farmer is definitely new, and I don't know how we never had a farmer background before. This just makes all the sense in the world that a lot of characters would come up from that. But something that I thought was cool was, oh, you just choose one language from your background? Wow, they're finally going to be reining in the insane amount of languages that a first level character can have. Not really. It actually says here with starting languages, you have common as a default, plus one that you get from your background, which can be a standard or rare language, and then you choose just one other standard language. So you start with at least three. <laughs> so you could just choose Druidic, even though it's typical user here is a Druid. You could choose Thieves Can, even though you're not a rogue. And to summarize changes to the feats, they said that yes, they're organizing them by level, and the main thing is there might be changing some of the names or changing some of the features, so they're just more obvious about what they do. They explicitly said that the healer feat was one that, oh, a lot of people used to choose that because they were playing a cleric, uh, but then it actually didn't really benefit you much if you were a cleric. So the idea here is, hey, you see the healer feat, oh, I'm playing a healer. Yes, it actually has stuff that will benefit you, but it will also provide some healing benefits to characters who wouldn't have those abilities otherwise. Oh, and here's a good one though. So they do have the lucky feat here, but instead of it being like over the top unbalanced, now you spend luck points for advantage on what they call a D20 test. So anytime instead of listing ability score increase, saving throw, and attack roll, they just call it a test to encompass all three of those roles. And the glossary here actually gives some awesome information that I'm gonna summarize. So. Arcane spells? What's that? Now, there are just going to be three spell lists. Arcane spells, divine spells, and primordial spells. This seems like an awesome move. It's actually based on the source of your magic, so it's way more intuitive. Oh, and here's something big. Rolling a one now means you just fail anytime. Like, that's how a lot of people played, and now they're building it in. Same thing, rolling a 20 means you succeed. So on an ability check, on a saving throw, whatever your modifiers are, if you roll a natural 20, you succeed. Again, this is all playtest, 
but I think those things will stay. Personally, I kind of like that idea. Something I'm not sure about is critical hits. This will only affect weapon and unarmed strikes. So spells cannot crit under these rules and monsters cannot crit under these rules. It's just for player characters. They kind of justified that saying like, oh, monsters have recharge abilities. That's kind of like a crit that you can choose when to use it. Basically, it's like if you're playing at level one and you accidentally crit, you know, you're the DM. Uh oh, I just rolled a crit. Now you're dead. <laughs> a lot of people don't like that. So it makes sense to have that recharge thing where it's like, okay, I have this powerful attack available, but I get to choose when I do it. So if they tweak how recharge works, make it a little more common, I could see that replacing monster crits for me. But if I'm the DM and I roll a natural 20, I want to be able to crit too. Uh, it looks like the grappled condition now actually does stuff because you know how in 5e everybody pretty much just uses the first round to get into position and then never moves. So where grappled used to just make your speed zero so you couldn't move but no one ever did anyway, it didn't matter. Now you actually have disadvantage on attack rolls against any target other than the grappler. Pretty cool. Other things, inspiration just gives you advantage on a roll. That's cool. You can also give advantage to other characters. And again, you get it anytime you roll a natural 20. It lasts until your next long rest. I really like that. It seems like an inspiration mechanic I would actually use. Long rest mostly seems the same, except one thing I noticed is it says if it's interrupted by combat, it just doesn't work unless you already rested for an hour, in which case it'll uh, gain the benefits of a short rest. A new condition called slowed. Uh, basically, I think it's just a quality of life for the designers because there are a lot of uh, other rules that do this thing where you spend one extra foot of movement for every foot of movement using your speed. So now instead of saying that for stuff like difficult terrain, you can just say you're slowed in difficult terrain. Bingo. And then here's the spell list. The one thing I'll point out about this that stood out to me, you know, arcane, divine, primal, is that under the well, none of the spell list, but I expected to see it under Arcane. I don't see the Eldritch Blast cantrip. So I think that means Eldritch Blast is just gonna be a Warlock feature. We'll see when they make an Unearthed Arcana playtest document for classes, but I hope this answered some of your questions about what is 1D&D. Thanks for watching, and keep building.